storm in a century roars up from the Gulf of Mexico, blanketing the northern U.S. with a blizzard and causing high seas in the Gulf of Mexico. El Nino threatens catastrophe in southern Australia from a vision of the apocalypse to scenes from the inferno. And when massive floods pour into America's Ohio River Valley, one population is completely helpless to save itself. Powerful storms and the people that survive them coming up on Storm Warning. It's March in the southeastern United States. On the coast of Florida, the winter has passed and the weather is getting balmy. George Capiton, skipper of the fishing boat Junebug, heads out to the open seas with a friend. The forecast is for clear skies. There was a cold front coming down, but it wasn't nothing serious. 40 mile an hour winds are what they were predicting. I didn't realize that the barometer was dropping the way it was. The radical drop in pressure means a frightening storm is brewing over the Gulf of Mexico. Arctic air from Canada skates across the United States and collides with the Gulf's warm air. The ensuing storm begins to blanket the entire eastern United States. This unseasonable weather catches a third of the nation off guard. In the northeastern United States, they call it the storm of the century. Temperatures plunge to near zero. Unexpected snowfall piles up to four feet. And if it's white in the north, it's wet in the south. The storm unleashes more than 50 tornadoes. As a wall of wind and rain slams into Florida, whipping the Gulf of Mexico into 30-foot seas. The waves began crashing in on the rear of the boat, knocked the cabin doors open, flooded the interior cabin. I started screaming Mayday on the radio. At this time, the water inside the cabin was up to my neck. We were getting rescue calls from just about every source available. It was like one minute, nothing was happening, and the next minute, the whole Gulf Coast was calling and, and requesting assistance. Coast Guard Commander Gregory Amernick and his crew take to the skies. The storm's monstrous waves are sinking ships from the Caribbean to Nova Scotia. Hold position, hold position. Half target, it is right below it. The Florida Coast Guard begins the busiest search and rescue weekend in its history. Commander Armanek responds to a distress call from George. The June bug is going down. The boat broke up really bad in that shallow water. I was scared, that's for sure. When we first got in the water, Gene said that we were both going to die. And I said, don't even think like that. We're going to make it. I said, we're only five miles from shore. If nothing else, we'll swim to shore. For three hours, the Coast Guard scans the choppy seas. Finally. The crew spots a line of wreckage. I would say uh, five minutes after arriving on scene, I saw George clinging to a piece of his boat. I don't believe he was, he was able to raise his hands to wave. There is no sign of George's friend. The chopper moves into position while the rescue swimmer readies the basket and prepares to lower himself into the frigid waters. George tries to hang on. Waves were 30 feet tall, and they would actually take you down to the bottom with your light jacket on. If they hadn't come to the rescue at the time, I don't believe I would have lasted more than a half an hour longer. 
George abandons the scrap of boat and swims toward the basket. Looking at him when he came into the cabin, he was very, very much uh, hypothermic and uh, he was almost incoherent. I would give him probably another hour, hour and a half in the water before we would probably have had different results. By now, George's body temperature has plummeted 16 degrees. He's severely hypothermic. I was wrapped up in two army blankets in the helicopter. My body temperature was 88 degrees. I've got three children and I uh, just made up my mind I wasn't going to die out there. Minutes later, the rescuers go back to George's shipmate, but he has not survived the freezing water. Back on solid ground, George is carried to an ambulance and rushed to the hospital. I would say that his ability to survive was pure will to survive. I would think a lot of it had to do with uh, the Almighty upstairs. And I would like to think that uh, the reason he's alive today is probably because of my crew and my helicopter. By the weekend's end, the Coast Guard has saved more than 150 people stranded in the deadly waters. States of emergency have been declared from Florida to Maine. High winds have pitched more than three million people into darkness. Houses all up and down the East Coast have been shattered. At its height, this storm of the century stretched nearly 800 miles along the Atlantic coast. It was no normal storm, uh, by no means. And being one of the pilots that flew on it uh, in the aftermath, I can tell you right now that it was a serious storm that needed to be reckoned with. George Capitan will never forget his near death at sea. And he'll never trust the elements again. A lot of respect for Mother Nature. The force that the water has got is unbelievable. The wind blowing, the salt spray hitting me in the face at over 100 miles an hour is an experience I hope I never have to go through again. Next, weather creates danger down under. It's called Down Under because it's just beneath the equator. In hot, rugged Australia, confronting a harsh climate is a way of life. But this summer, the elements are beyond extreme. Very large areas of the southeast of our country registered the lowest rainfall actually on record. We had a, a formation of a, of a front way back uh, over, sort of towards the, the far reaches of Western Australia. And Meteorologist this, this John front, McBride tracks strange weather, El Nino. It's the worst one, or the most severe El Nino that we've had this century. This abnormally warm ocean current has been altering trade winds, which causes radical weather shifts. The winds became quite strong and hot and dry. You knew something was going to happen. It does. Bushfires begin breaking out all over the southernmost state of Victoria. Oily native plants like eucalyptus and gum trees burst into flames. I was sitting there watching all of this on television and switching from channel to channel and seeing journalists sort of in front of walls of flame and people being evacuated. And there was a whole glow in the sky to the southwest of where we were. That's when we realised that a fire was coming. Daryl Dalton checks to see how his rhododendrons have survived the drought. A non-native species, it's used as a firebreak in this part of Australia. But nothing can stop the runaway bushfire headed in Daryl's direction. The conditions that led to these hellish scenes began weeks earlier, with a rapid temperature fluctuation that Australians call the cool change. We have these very severe cool changes or these very sort of spectacular fronts because of the large temperature contrast between the very hot, uh, dry continent that builds up during, the, during our summer and the cool air, cool moist air from the Southern Ocean to the south. 
But in this drought-plagued El Nino year, the cool change is catastrophic. In Melbourne, summer temperatures climb to record highs. Then the temperature plummets. The wind begins to howl. Very strong, gusty winds. It's a, it's a front came through 50 knots, hurricane-type strength. On the horizon comes a vision straight from the apocalypse. Suddenly, you see this massive wall of dust coming down on you, moving down the street through the city of Melbourne. I've lived in Melbourne all my life and I've never seen anything vaguely resembling a massive wall of dust 300 metres high moving in over the city. The winds are carrying the drought-dried soil high into the atmosphere. The reaction was basically one of bewilderment and, and panic, I think, on the part of most of the population. I don't know what it is. I thought it was the second coming. As the dust storm swallows the city centre, the wind whips sand into people's eyes and covers them with gritty dust. The blinding storm brings traffic to a standstill. Melbourne's three airports shut down. But as the cool change causes chaos, climatologists get a remarkable snapshot of the weather in action. We were quite excited by this because of the dust formation process in the cold air. The whole actual cold front was visualised like in a laboratory model and you could actually see the structure of the cold air as it moved in. Generally when you have one body of air that's colder than another body of air, it flows under it. This flow is what drives the powerful wind, which begins to die down over Melbourne. But as soon as the dust settles, the temperatures start to build again. It's not long before another cold front pushes a wall of wind onto land. In Victoria, you can pick a cool change in a matter of 15 minutes, it can drop 10 degrees. And that's what it did that morning. The winds were like what I would call cyclonic winds because they were absolutely gale force. The fire is started by the winds, which have toppled a sparking power line. As the blaze approaches Daryl Dalton's town of Mount Macedon, people start to flee. When evening comes, Daryl hasn't decided whether to leave. You could hardly breathe because of the smoke. And then all these embers were starting to fall like a fury. But he's an old hand at fighting bushfires. He decides to stay. All my dreams are here. All the things that I want were here. Daryl will regret that decision before the night is over. When we come back, a man's journey through an inferno. And as floodwaters ravage Ohio, thousands must flee. Parched bush from Australia's worst El Nino drought burns throughout the state of Victoria. The weather anomaly also sends gale force winds to fan the flames. In the village of Mount Macedon, it's too late to evacuate. Roads out of town are covered by rivers of fire. And smoke is pouring in under Daryl Dalton's door. Since the winds have knocked out power, Daryl must use a lantern to navigate. Only to learn that the water is out too. I really couldn't tell you at what stage the house caught on fire. I've forgotten completely the time because you're just looking to stay alive. As Daryl rushes to grab important papers, he thinks about whether to flee or stay in the house. Sometimes bushfires flash over a home, merely scorching it, leaving people inside alive. But it's a huge gamble. I nearly had a heart seizure when I had pains in my chest when we were deciding whether we would stay or go. As the heat increases, he decides to make a run for it. All the ground was burning, it was smouldering, and the fire was creeping up towards the house. We heard this dreadful noise, like a half a dozen steam trains coming towards us. I was burnt in the face and across the eye. There was flames all around us, from, from the buildings that had burnt, and the trees that were burning, our next door neighbours' houses were burning. The fire was there, right, right with us, falling out of the sky.
Somehow, Daryl survives to daylight, but many have not. Seven people were killed at Mount Macedon. Five of those were killed within a matter of 40 yards of us. A total of 75 people have perished. 2,500 homes are destroyed. All of the, the houses that were there before the fire, all the gardens, and there was just nothing left except ash, a white ash. The severe drought and fierce winds driven by El Nino have caused a vision of the apocalypse and of hell that survivors will never forget. But I think probably the biggest lesson that I learned in going through a horrendous experience like that was that money is not everything. It gave me more sensitivity, I, you know, I, I think, it, to, to life itself and to people. Next, floodwaters threaten helpless thousands. The worst March rains in three decades fall on America's Ohio River Valley as dangerous floodwaters rise by the minute. Thousands flee to higher ground, and thousands are left behind. A farmer's cattle huddle on the last patch of land. A border collie named Sam waits anxiously on a rooftop. And Viper, a Rottweiler pup, is left alone to face the storm with no shelter and no food. The next day, as the National Guard rushes in to aid the flood's human victims, another rescue team comes to the aid of the animals. We've got a request for nine cats, five dogs, and a ferret that were left behind. So the Terry Crisp directs an organization that sends volunteers into disaster areas to help stranded animals. Even if we find the cat, what you may want us to do is to take it down to the shelter so that we can have the vet look at it. The Emergency Animal Rescue Service Program, or EARS as we call it, responds to disasters all across the country, um, basically providing the same kinds of services for animals that the Red Cross would for people. Okay. Um, we shelter, we rescue, evacuate. Hopefully the cats can get up on high ground. Well. Two months earlier, Ears was in Northern California, where the worst flood in 50 years stranded enough animals to fill an ark. In any disaster that we do, there's always a stray population that existed before that disaster hit. And when a disaster situation or crisis is going on, they're definitely overlooked. We've actually gone into floods where we have found dogs that are still chained in backyards, animals that are still confined in um, barns, stalls, pasture areas. And if they don't have a human being there to unlock gates, they're, they're trapped. It's not that people don't care. Farmer Gerald Bailey's been shuttling out into the flood to help his stranded calf. I kept his head up out of the water and uh, finally got him over there to the corn crib, which it had about six inches of water in it. But that was six inches compared to about four foot in the barn. The rains have stopped, but the flood is still rising, six inches an hour. The Ohio River is 18 feet above flood stage. Some managed to brave the flood to check on their pets. I hear you, Scooter. But some pets and owners are still separated. Hi, Casey. Hi, Kitty. OK, I've got Casey. Don't have a fear, but I've got Casey. We try and, and rescue animals using the proper equipment, reducing the stress on them the best we can. They're very confused, you know, unlike people, you can't sit down and explain to them um, what is happening. I think one of the greatest frustrations that we encounter when we're out in the field rescuing is that these animals are very frightened and they need help and oftentimes they don't cooperate. When we bring them into the shelters that we set up, um, 
it's confusing for them, so we're always concerned about trying to minimize the noise and confusion to get them past that stressful situation. Sorry about this indignity, sweetheart. <laughs> and most shelters are understaffed, so to try and keep up with the daily log of calls and then deal with a disaster also is challenging. By day three, Sam the Border Collie is off the roof and getting warmed up while he waits to see his owners. The Golden Retriever has been rescued. Casey the Cat is recovering from his ordeal. He's just real scared, I know he is. Even the ferret has been found. But Viper, the Rottweiler pup, is still waiting to be rescued until a passerby comes to his aid. He was on one step at his back door, and he was just staring at the water, which was coming up by the minute. This is a strange Rottweiler that I didn't know. So, um, you know, we were scared for a moment, but once I got up to the dog, I knew at that moment that the dog, you know, he wanted help. It's okay. Being an animal lover, I was, I was mad because humans, we can, def we can fend for ourselves. Animals can't in this situation. Come here, baby. Oh. Oh. We honestly didn't think the water would get in the house. Some people feel bad about what their animals have gone through. Like I'm letting them down. Like um, I'm going to be punished for this because I couldn't take care of them. The thing that people have to understand is that, yes, we come in to help the animals, but at the very same time, we are helping people. The reunions between owners and their animals is the highlight of what we do because we always put ourselves in these situations. I mean, how would we feel if for some reason in a disaster we got separated from our animals? All right, nowhere else is gone. That's completely lost. Take your shoes off. Just to get the dogs back is our family's complete again. Many people in the Ohio River Valley need this kind of solace. 31 people have died in the floods, and over 3,000 are homeless. I just love to see how this benefits everybody all the way around, the two-legged ones and the four-legged ones. By being able to do this for people and for animals, it continues to remind us why it's so important for us to be there.